Hey guys, welcome back to the Compass Games Learn to Play series. Today we welcome developer Kevin Bernatz, and he's going to be giving us an introduction and overview of how to play Oceans of Fire from designer Rob Bama. So let's dig right in. Over to you, Kevin. Hi everyone, this is Kevin Bernatz of Doc Bernatz Development, and I'm going to talk to you about Rob Bama's new game for Compass Games, Oceans of Fire. And this is a game, uh, you can see the box cover in the back. It's, it's the Pacific Theater, World War II. Covers the entire war, 41 to 45. Uh, it's designed primarily for two to three players. It has a separate Commonwealth player, as well as the Americans and the Japanese. And it has the lesser actors also involved, the, the Dutch, the Burmese, and so on and so forth. So it's a game that draws its lineage from victory in the Pacific and it's an area movement game. Let me show you the back of the box. So it has an area movement map. You can see it's a fairly large footprint on the map. You have basically 34 by 44 uh, and two map sections. We do have some scenarios that use only one map or one map and maybe a portion of the other. So we are cognizant of space for, for maps. If there's Vassal as well, but uh, it is going to be a, a large game, a monster game, as we would say. And you can see there's six counter sheets. There is a deck of event cards. The event cards, I'm not gonna get into too much in this video, they're, they're optional. Basically they add historical events in, in some aspect that players can use or you know, extra reinforcements, so on and so forth, just to add some, some variance and, and certainly replayability to the game. But they are, they're optional. They're not uh, required for playing of the game. And then lots of player aids. So this is, again, it's, it's a monster game. You're going to have lots of enjoyment out of this one. And let me pop over to the Vaso module and we can talk a little bit about the map and what the map shows. So I'll just look at this area around Australia. There's three types of areas in Oceans of Fire. We broke it down into a land area, which is basically all land. Then there's sea areas, so like the Coral Sea or Tasman Sea that are all sea. And then what we termed mixed areas. So a, a mixed area is going to have a sea portion and then one or more playable island portions or island spaces and a sea space. So that's what the map is going to be, be laid out as. We do have for some of the larger off-map areas, we, we term these off-map boxes. We have a New Zealand box, a, there's a, a British and Persia box. The U.S. is sort of abstracted out uh, just because the Pacific is so large as it is. We need to somehow abstract some of the areas that were important, but were sort of on the edges of where the main action occurred. So in each area, what you're going to see is a control marker, which is printed on the map. So if it's the default control, you don't actually have to have the marker on the map. You just you know, use what's printed. The control marker will show who's currently uh, owns the space. One side's gonna be Japanese. The other side is either going to be British or American, depending what the initial control was at, at the start of the war. And to some extent, for like the Japanese, what theater it ends in. So like Palau is in the US theater. You can see this is sort of the theater boundary line here. So if this area is taken over by the allies, it would go to US control. In each land space, you're going to have either some semblance of open terrain or clear terrain or jungle. You wanna explain this early because this I'm sure it's gonna be a, an issue that we, we get questions on later, but in terms of combat effects, we have no special combat effects for jungle terrain. And the reasoning is combat in this theater was difficult no matter where. You didn't have the infrastructure like in Europe. Obviously jungle had supply issues and everything else. So instead of having a jungle DRM that you'd apply 90% you know, of the time and, and you know, affected almost all the spaces where, where combat was occurring, we decided to not have a DRM and abstract out the impact of jungle based on the stats of these spaces. So for each space, you're going to have, like I said, the control marker, you'll have the name of the space, you'll have a division stacking, an air basing, 
and one or more ports. Uh, most bases have one or more ports. Some places will have no ports. And ports come in three different sizes. You have minor ports, which are just the, the circle with a single number. And those really are used only for transports. Uh, that's really, they're, they're more like uh, landing areas for bringing in reinforcements, uh, ground troops and stuff like that. Then you have the anchor, the black anchor with the white circle. Those are called minor ports. And depending on the, the size of the port, so if, if it's a red number, I think up in Okinawa, it can't house the really big capital ships, so the battleships, the fleet carriers, but it can house all the other ships, transports, cruisers, light cruisers, so on and so forth. The black ports can house any ship. And then you have the major ports, which will have a yellow circle. And those are really more for reinforcements and repair, ship repair and stuff like that. But they're going to be the, your ports that have the biggest capacity, obviously. Those are your major ports. You know, I think they go up to 12. So, you know, Japan has some major ports uh, in obvious locations. And actually, while we're at Japan, we can show the other aspects and area. So you have, whether it's a supply source or not, Japan will be red, U.S. is green, British will be a, a tan. You have resources, so each shovel would be one resource, and then you have oil resources located down here. And resources are important because it's going to drive the Japanese, I don't want to say economy, because we don't have unit production. Units all arrive via scheduled uh, reinforcement chart. But the way the game works is it's action point or command point driven. And so Japan gets a set number of command points on turn one. The U.S. always gets a set number. But you notice here, Japan gets this variable number of command points. And that's predicated on the number of resources they have. So they have this goal to expand out. Expand out, grab as much resources as they can, because that's going to give them the most command points. The most command points allow them to do the most actions to push even further to stymie the U.S. response, so on and so forth. So you have this natural incentive to take what they took historically because that's where the resources are. And then the last thing you'll see in these areas are these stars. So the stars are your victory points. So not only is Japan, do they have to be conscientious of where the resources are because they need those for their action points or command points, but they also want to grab places that have stars. In some areas for like victory, you have to control both, you know, both areas. So that's why we sort of represent it by like a half star. So most victory points are one. Some of these, like I said, are, are basically half. And then some areas might go up to like three victory points. Now it's extremely difficult to take Oahu. So it's definitely worth it if they can but it's not something we really saw much and it shouldn't be. I mean, it should be very difficult for Japan to invade and, and conquer Oahu. There's a few other aspects on the map that deal with uh, the strategic bombing or the sub campaign. I don't want to get into that too much because we're not really going to deal with that right now, but there's a lot going on in terms of how we move between areas. That I guess I probably should briefly touch about. So, the basic default is just going to be a border and that's just you know represented here in c's it's going to be pink you also notice for the mixed areas we have the names in pink uh, to help uh, distinguish what's a mixed area versus a sea area or a land area and then for some of these islands if they're close enough that there's land transport you'll have these white land straits so it allows land movement and then you have either orange arrows, which are Japanese. It allows their naval air to fly. That's the only air that can cross an orange. And then there's yellow ones. Let me see down here, for example, where any air. So these are considered adjacent for air. And that's pretty much everything that's going to be on the map. Uh, this uh, a mountain border uh, that has effects for combat. Um, and I guess there's impassable borders which also affects interception and prohibits movement, usually on, on certain turns or certain types of movement. So let's look a little bit at the counters. Land counters are going to follow the same layout. 
where you have a name, you either have a turn of entry or a setup location. You'll have a, either infantry or armor symbol, though for game purposes, unless you're playing with optional rules, the armor really has no game effect. It's, it's only if you play an optional rule that it'll have a game effect. And then you have attack factor, defense factor, and troop quality. Most troop qualities for Japan are going to be three. And then they'll have a few lower quality units that come late in the war. So this is turn eight, which is the last turn of the game. And then they have a few elite units. They're, they're level fours, including their SNLF units here that also uh, troop quality four. For the US, their Marines are going to be troop quality fours. And they have the airborne unit here. That's also troop quality four. And then most of the rest of the US units are troop quality three. And same with the British. They're going to be troop quality three. The Australians are troop quality three, except for some of the elite Australian units, which would be troop quality four. And the Burmese and Chinese units and, and so on would generally be troop quality one. I think Indian units are generally troop quality two. In terms of air, air is abstracted. So we, we went with a system where air is just going to be point value. We don't have specific aircraft. The Japanese naval bombers are represented. It's these navs. So they, they do get, like I said, the, the benefit of flying across the orange straits where no other aircraft can fly across those. But otherwise, you'll see they're just their points. One, two, fours of either land-based air, naval air, and same with the U.S., land-based air. They don't have the NAVs, but they do have marine air. So the Cactus Air Force is sort of represented here. They have B-29s, which are used for strategic warfare, and then carrier air. They're either half factor, which I know some people are not going to like, or one factor. The, the, the way the air works, it seems weird at first. Look, oh, it's a half factor. Why, why don't you just make this one and these two? But it does work. It takes a little mental uh, getting used to, but once you start playing, you'll realize, okay, there's a method to the madness. And these, these half factor air, which you'll see on some of the smaller carriers, some of these smaller carriers, they only really hold enough what would be termed a half air. But the default fleet carrier for Japan is Again, based on the, the data that, that Rob, you know, he crunched all the numbers, they're basically two and a half points compared to, for the U.S., the late war carriers are threes. So there's just that little bit of difference that we needed to sort of portray. And the easiest way to do that was to use a, a half point representation here. So for the fleet carriers for Japan, they start each one is two and a half air points, basically. And you'll notice Japan is going to be a little different than the U.S. All the U.S. carrier air, it's one quality, just normal quality. The Japanese carrier start as this plus, or the elites. And you'll see later on when they get their reinforcements, they start getting low quality carrier air. And you'll notice this when you're playing. I mean, the elite carrier air for Japan really does give them that sword that can really punch through things. But this game is very attritional. And so what's going to happen is as Japan is pushing and pushing and pushing, which again, they have to do, they need to take the resources, they need to take the victory points, their carrier air is slowly going to start getting attrited. The elite carrier air is going to start becoming regular quality, then it's going to start becoming low quality. And you'll notice that difference. You'll actually feel it in the game. You'll be like, you'll be missing your, your elite carrier air that you had at the start. So that's one of the aspects I really liked about this design that, that Rob has is, is that feel of the, the attritional nature of this war. And you'll see that when we also get into the land and the ground combat. Uh, almost always in every ground combat, both the attacker and the defender are going to take losses. So in terms of ground combat and losses, the way we represent that is it's going to be hit markers. I know some people don't like hit markers, uh, damage markers, because they're going to add more counters, but it's really the best way to handle it for this type of, of attritional nature of the combat. So what will happen is, 
you know, as you, as these units take losses, you'll put a hit marker underneath it. So I think it's just a yeah, place hit marker. So it starts out as, you know, for VASO one and you can, can increase it and so on and so forth. Now, one aspect, again, because we're cognizant of the fact that we want to eliminate as many excess markers as possible, just because we don't want, you know, map clutter. I mean, we are, are conscientious of this. So every unit on the back side is going to be half value. So for a seven strength unit, after it loses its fourth point, it effectively becomes a three, three unit. Every damage that's applied to this, it reduces both the attack and defense by one. So if this had two damage, it'd be a five, five unit effectively. And when it gets down to a three, three unit, instead of having a damage marker, you can just flip it. This also means we don't need as many damage markers. We don't, you know, don't need seven, eight, nine value damage markers because we can flip the units and take care of half of the damage just by flipping the unit. The other thing you'll notice is it adds this reduced stripe. Reduced units cost less to activate. They stack at half value. There's many effects where a reduced size unit uh, actually uh, matters. And so that's the other thing is it allows us to easily represent that by having these reduced strength units when they get to half damage. Let's see, the other counters, there's airfield upgrades, port upgrades, you have forts. Um, those are your, your construction units that people can build. Then we have the naval units. So naval units, you're going to have the type of unit, so carrier, light carrier, battleship, cruiser, so on and so forth. You're going to have the name. You're going to have the anti-air on all, all ships will have an anti-air value. Then you'll have the surface factors and the defense. So for battleships, you know, you're going to have values here. For carriers, they're not going to have a surface factor, so they're going to have a zero, but they're still going to have a defense factor. And then the middle is the shore bombardment. So again, for carriers, you're not going to have anything there. For battleships, it's going to be two, pretty much for cruisers or battleships. I mean, there are some exceptions depending on the class of the cruiser that goes into the counters. But each capital ship is represented. So this is a single ship. It's going to have two shore bombardment. This, you'll see the two silhouettes. It's actually these two ships sort of uh, taken together. And so it's going to have the four shore bombardment, obviously two plus two. And so that's the shore bombardment. Then you have movement. So most most of the battleships are going to be two movements. The, the late war U.S. battleships will be three. Most ships are basically two or three movement. And then on the right is your carrier, your air capacity. So obviously battleships, cruisers, so on will have uh, no capacity. And then light carriers will have generally a half to two and the fleet carriers will generally have two and a half to three i think the big yeah so remember these are two two ships if i flip it you'll see it's it's just a single carrier so each one is three and these are the late war the big u.s fleet carriers we also have some submarines which are used in the strategic warfare it's actually optional in terms of strategic warfare it's it's represented for the campaign game only because it, it can have a pretty big impact on japan and so if you're playing a short scenario we, we tend to recommend not using the uh, strategic warfare you have transports transports these tt units they're just abstracted they add a capacity uh, every all the other stats are the same and then we have i want to show the fleet uh, supply train. So this is this is basically the mobile port for the U.S. And so it has a base, which is where it, it's centrally located. And then you place this out in the sea and allows the U.S. to increase the capacity of a of an area of a port or you know base units at sea, which really is necessary to do some of the island hopping and pushing forward that the U.S. needs to do late in the war. Japan is orange. British are this color here. The Australians are this slightly uh, different shade of tan. And then the U.S. are green. So that's naval units. That's the map. Let's talk about how the game generally flows. So there are eight turns in the game. And each turn, 
the first thing you do is basically determine your command points for each side. So there's three sides, even if it's a two player game, Commonwealth, US and Japan. The side that has the most command points is going to go first and that's this initiative. So usually it's gonna be Japan until about, probably about turn three or four, usually it's turn three when the US is going to end up with more command points than Japan. Now, if Japan's doing really well, they might push it back to turn four. If they didn't do quite so well initially, the initiative might shift you know, at the start of turn three or maybe even turn two, though that's extremely rare. Once you have the initiative order, there's gonna be rounds. So there's four rounds and in each round, each player takes an impulse. So for example, Round one, Japan goes first, then the US, then the Commonwealth. Commonwealth is always going to go last. They're always going to have the least command points. So there's a total of 12 impulses every turn. Japan, US, Commonwealth, Japan, US, Commonwealth, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, at some point, the initiative shifts and it goes US, Japan, Commonwealth. And so what that does do is it gives the US a double move. And that can be fairly important because it can allow the US to do something that's unexpected by Japan because they can hit them and hit them again before they're able to reinforce an area that they have partially damaged. So how do impulses work? You're gonna check supply. I'm not gonna get into that, but you know, basically there's a supply check to see how units, uh, there's different levels of unsupply. Uh, generally most units are in supply and then they, when they're first out of supply, they'll be out of supply level one, and then they'll go to out of supply level two. Supply tracing is, is fairly easy. If you're on the coast, you can trace out to sea, and there's unlimited number of sea areas, as long as the enemy doesn't have units in port or air points in port bordering those sea areas, in which case they can block it. But then you can contest that if you also have naval units or air points. If you're inland, you can go up to two land areas and then out to a port. And that's basically supply tracing. When you do strategic bombing, there's ship repair, adjust carrier. So we, we, don't, we try to encourage players to have their carrier air on the carriers. I mean, certainly carrier air did function as sort of a ground-based air in this campaign. And that is okay. Uh, it does, re it loses a lot of its effectiveness. So there's certainly, game incentive to keep your carrier air on your carriers but we also have you know different locations where the player wants to freely move their carrier air back to their carriers we allow that again we want to encourage that the carrier air should stay on the carriers but not hard code it because historically there were times when the carrier was used as sort of a, a ground-based air then it's activation. I'm gonna get into this when I actually work through a invasion of the Philippines, but you have ground movement, you have air movement, you have land movement, and then you have operation. So I, I do want to emphasize there's, there's two types of activations. You either have activations for movement or activations that involve combat. If it's going to involve combat, there's going to be an operation. And this is really the heart of the game. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time on, on talking about operations because that's how the game flows. That was something that uh, Rob really wanted. He wanted to have a game with an operational feel. And just finishing up the turn, you'd you know, resolve strategic warfare, check to see if anyone is now in supply, and then you know just do cleanup. And then the other players take their turns. And then after everyone has taken the 12 impulses, there's this interface where you see if the resources have changed, if they gained or lost resources, victory points, so on and so forth. And this is where you get your replacement points. You can do some strategic movement or redeployments, what we call them. There's no combat here, and yet it, it's greatly restricted on, on where you can move. Uh, you get to construct forts and, and, and stuff like that here, though you can also do this during the turn, but it's going to cost your command points. So you see here that's one CP is 12 activation points. These activation points are what you're going to use to move stuff around, to construct forts, airfields, ports during the turn. So this this is this is your limiting factor. So you're always going to feel like you need more of these. And then once you've done this last bit of the interphase, you advance the turn. So 
I think operations are, are better shown um, versus just walking through. I mean, there's a nice player aid to help you walk through an operation until you sort of get used to it. Because again, operations are critical. It's how combat is done. So let's say this is the first turn. You know, this is a Japanese initial setup. The Pearl Harbor raid, it, it's always something that's difficult if you have a game that has this because you know, the surprise aspect, there's so many things that went into this that you you need to sort of decide is it going to be just standard rules or special rules that that handle the raid. And so we ended up going with a special rule that so you're going to use it once every campaign and it involves the, the Pearl Harbor raid and how it's resolved. Then there are many special rules that sort of model this surprise that Japan achieved on the first turn. And some of these are, you know, their air get added benefits. The allies really can't intercept except for you know, very few units. The allied air is affected, their anti-air. Uh, there's a lot of game effects that go to model this strategic surprise that Japan received on the first turn. So going back to the map here, first turn of the game, they would use these naval units from the fleet box here, that's their main fleet carriers, conduct the Pearl Harbor raid. Now it is optional. You don't have to actually do the Pearl Harbor raid. It's a choice. If they do it, the naval units go, they resolve the Pearl Harbor raid, then they come back. And they, they can be used very limited. Uh, they can't be used for down in the Philippines. So for our purposes, we're just going to ignore the assume these guys are all committed to uh, Pearl Harbor and therefore not available. And then what's going to happen is Japan, we can pull up the command points. For turn one, they start with seven command points. Now, if they do the Pearl Harbor raid, that goes up to eight. So there's, there's two different ways that you can track this, because as I said before, every command point generates 12 action points. The way Rob prefers and, and Rob's way is you have your command points, and then every time that you need to spend action points, you, okay, deduct the command point and you get your 12 action points. And as you go down, you know, you, you just keep you know, adding 12 every time you reduce the CPs. And that's fine, that, that works. The alternative, and we did include this, so that people have a choice. Well, what's eight times 12? It's 96. So if you'd rather just convert it right off the start and go, okay, we have 96 action points and then just deduct action points using the times one and times 10, that's the alternative. And both means are provided for depending on how people, which whichever one people prefer. I tend to prefer this. So that's what I'm gonna use for this video, but either way works. So we start off as Japan with 96 action points. So what do we want to do? If we need to just move stuff around, we could just move stuff and it's not going to initiate combat. Now they could be intercepted. So there could be combat that's initiated by the other side. But if you're just moving stuff, then the acting player is not initiating combat. But in this particular case, we're like, okay, we're going to go after Luzon and Mindanao. And so we're going to declare an operation into the Philippine Sea. And so the first thing we're going to do is let's activate some units in Formosa and commit them to this operation. So we're going to activate this cruiser and full transport. So it's a capacity eight transport. So that's two full strength naval units. Uh, full strength naval units going to be three action points. If it's a reduced strength naval unit, it's two action points unless you have two of them in the same port. So effectively it's one and a half. Each reduced strength naval unit is half of a full strength naval unit. But the only time you get the benefit is if you're activating two in the same port. Divisions cost four action points. Other ground units are going to be two. And each air point is effectively one AP per air point. There's port upgrades. You can see, you know, they're fairly expensive for all sorts of construction and then committing stuff to strategic warfare or if we have this for the optional card play if people are using the cards so we have two naval units two full strength naval units that's going to be six action points we also want to activate these two ground units 
So that's going to be another six. So that's 12 action points right there. And I'm going to actually put these guys on the transport that's carrying them. It costs one action point to come out of the port and then one action point here. Now, because I've declared this as an operation, I'm going to mark the Philippine Sea with combat. I also declare that I'm targeting Luzon and Mindanao. So I mark both of those with combat markers as well. I don't have to say at this point which units are attacking which. And I also don't get intercepted at this point because I still have units that I'm going to be moving into this area. However, I can't take and, oh, I'm going to move these guys and, and move them. No. Once you initiate an operation, everything you do has to be for this operation. Now, and this is this is something that people are going to have to get used to. Once you run an operation and it's run to completion, this flips over to its combat concluded side. The way we model time is once there's a combat concluded in an area, you're greatly restricted on what can move through. So like I can't move these guys through to go attack down into the cell of BC once there's a combat concluded. So what I could do is if I wanted to do that, I could move them here and mark them with a either movement passing through or mission passing through. I don't have to declare what the mission is. I don't have to declare where the target is. I'm just indicating that these guys are moving through this area to do an operation or movement somewhere else. And so they're not going to participate in any of the combat in this area. They, they can participate in the naval combat and their air combat, but they, they're not participating in any of the ground combats here. They're moving through, they're passing through this area. That's one way that this can be done in terms of these operations and the, the, the timing and the sequencing. The other way, and the way that I would recommend players try to get in the habit of is you run this operation first, right? Run the further operation first, then you can do this operation because the only area that's going to be marked combat concluded is the farther away area. So you're not going to have the concern where you have to plan everything ahead and have it already in this area. Now, obviously in here, you could go through the Borneo Sea, avoid this. Um, so it's not going to be as problematic as one may think, it, but it does require players to spend a little bit of time thinking, what? Well, how am I going to run these operations? What's the sequencing? Is is there a sequencing that matters? You'll find down in the Solomons, you know, if there's combat going on in the Burbal or the Bismarck Sea mixed area and in the Solomons mixed area, Japan will have to sort of think, well, you know, what do I need here? Do I, do I run this one first and then this one? Or is do I need to run this combat first? In which case I need to already know what I'm sending through to get to the Solomons. It is something that you'll have to get used to, but once you get used to it, you'll find that it really does give you this feel of you're running these operations. You're focused in one area, you're doing that combat, you're doing, you know, okay, now let's island hop and do this next operation. Going back, so we have started this operation into the Philippine Sea. We've committed these guys, it cost 12 action points. So let's take and deduct that. Now, we want to send this guy using this transport. So again, full strength naval unit is three, division is four, that's going to be another seven action points. So we spend the seven action points. one to come out of port, one to move to this area. Then we're going to send these naval units in support. So we have the two light carriers, they're in the same port, so they're going to activate together at only three action points. And then the three battleships for another three each, so a total of 12 action points. And again, one out, two into this mixed area. And these actually should be marked as activated. I mean, usually it's pretty obvious in terms of 
when you have naval units because they're actually out at sea. Naval units generally are always in port. If they're out at sea, you know they've been activated. So that was another 12. And then the last thing I'll activate for the purpose of this sort of example is some air points. So a special rule for Japan, like I said, these navs can always fly across this orange, but on turn one, their land-based air can also fly across. So we're gonna activate, I think this is 12 total. Yes, yeah, so normally this would cost 12 action points as these fly across this orange uh, arrow. But on turn one, they're actually half cost because this is like an extended range arrow. So these effectively are only six air points, even though you know there's, there's 12. Normally you'd have to pay for the full 12, but again, special rule for turn one, Japan pays half cost when their air points are halved. So that's going to be another six activation points. So we're at five, so that's gonna go up to nine. And they would be marked activated. So that, let's say, is, is all Japan wants to do for their attack into the, the Philippine Sea. Actually, I did something wrong here. Uh, let me just quickly correct this, I noticed. For a crossing arrow like this, if it's pointed to the mixed area, then you can move the air points to the mixed area entirely, which means they can fly to any island in the area. If it's pointed directly to an island, which each island is sort of represented by these circles, then the air points can only fly missions to that island. So these air points actually need to be placed directly in the Luzon area. So they only can fly missions to Luzon. They can't fly it to anywhere. So I wanna correct that. So once you are done, activate your units and you say, okay, I'm, I'm done moving. I'm done activating units. Do you wish to intercept? The opposing player then has the opportunity to intercept with naval units and air units. Ground units never intercept. Interception is never automatic. Uh, I'll pull up the chart and show you. It's fairly simple. It's, it's a fairly uniform number with some DRMs that you will quickly internalize once you start playing. Six or higher is a successful interception. And then there's various DRMs. Most of these won't apply. And again, most of these you'll just internalize and quickly recognize whether it's it's a minus one or a plus one and so on and so forth. And you're just gonna roll a D10 for either each unit or if it's a stack of naval units coming from the same port and see if they successfully intercept. If their area is attacked, there's automatic interception. For these US four land-based air points, they don't have to roll. They automatically activate and intercept, but only if they're intercepting to their own area. Uh, for turn one, that's all they can do. They can only intercept to Luzon. Otherwise they could intercept out to the Philippine Sea, but then they'd have to roll. And if they failed their roll, they would not get to automatically intercept. Uh, against them. So they basically would get bombed on the airfields. But if they intercepted out here, they could be used to bomb the naval units. Here, all they can do is fight these air points. But if they're out here, they're going to fight the air points too. But here, and they survive the air combat, all they could do was support with ground factors, uh, the ground combat that goes on in Luzon. So, you know, they could have intercepted out to here too to support this ground combat again if they were allowed i mean they're not allowed on turn one but they'd have to roll so for turn one all they can do is intercept to luzon there's no naval units involved so it's not really going to be naval combat let me pop over to the player aids and just briefly show you how naval combat would work if there was naval combat so for naval combat each player is going to decide whether they want a carrier battle or a surface battle. Now, if you don't have any carriers, you have to pick surface. If you don't have any surface ships, you have to pick carrier. And then you each roll. And whoever rolls higher, their choice works. And then the tie, it goes to a carrier battle. If it's a surface combat, you're gonna look at attack factors and you can sum 
you know, if you have multiple ships firing at a single ship, you would sum it up. There's a few DRMs, battleships firing at basically non-battleships. You're going to get a positive DRM if the target's a battleship and you're not firing at it with all battleships or, you know, the big ships, you're going to get a negative DRM. And then you just roll a D10. And that's the number of hits that are inflicted on the ship. And you see that there is a chance you need a critical, which can you know range from four to 12 hits. A critical is not always going to be a lot of extra damage, depending on what you roll. For a carrier battle, what happens is, actually, let me switch back. I'll show you the battle board that we have. So for a naval combat, you're going to have your main force, a force that's screened. So this is if you have carriers or a lot more naval units than the opponent, you can screen some of your naval units so they can't be attacked by surface ships. And then after the first round of combat, there could be disengaging or pursuing ships. And then you have carrier air and ground-based air. So if it's a carrier battle, for each air point you have, you're going to roll on the anti-air chart. So depending on your anti-air points, you just roll a D10, and the air point is either going to be disrupted, which basically halves its effectiveness. It's going to be aborted, which means it breaks off its attack and is no longer used, or it's going to be eliminated. And there's various DRMs. The big one is going to be this plus one on turns five to eight. And also, remember, I'm looking at some of the U.S. ships, but the U.S. anti-air starts to get quite large. So the combination of these high U.S. anti-air values as well as this plus one are really going to start shredding the Japanese air factors as they come in to bomb the, the allied units. And once the anti-aircraft is resolved, any air point that gets through is going to roll on the naval bombing table, which is right here. So each air point rolls twice. So that's is where the CV one half, they're half an air point, so they're only going to roll once. So they roll once on this table. A CV, a normal CV air point would roll twice. A critical hit obviously can do you know a range of damage. There are different modifiers. The elite have this big plus one. It's target units in port. Uh, that's another plus one. Everything else is mostly uh, negative DRMs. And it's just straight damage to the, the enemy unit. So that's how carrier air battles work. Land-based air work very similarly, except it's just a single round of combat. The ground-based air bomb once, and then they're done. And they, they bomb at a different time in the operation resolution than when you would resolve a carrier battle. So carrier battles, that's resolved as part of naval combat and that could last multiple rounds. So carrier air could potentially bomb a unit four, five, six times if the guy does not successfully disengage. So air combat. Air combat works fairly straightforward. You have a number of air points. Now for turn one, allied air points are halved. So effectively the US gets two air points and Japan is going to get six air points. Remember these are 12 factors, but they flew in through extended. There's actually a marker place extended range. Okay. So all these guys flew extended range. So you'd put this marker on, which indicates that they are half factors. So there's only six ground based air points here. And then what are on the carriers? So you have the Hoshu and the Zuiho. So this is a CVA one. And this is CV one half. So we could pull these off and put them into this area down here. I'm just going to leave them on the carrier display because it's easy to know they're one and a half. So we're going to have a total of seven and a half air points. So now let's look at the air combat table. For the air combat table, we're just going to roll a D10 for each air point. If it's a CV one half or a lone, something that's a half point, you roll a minus two. If it's turn one in certain areas, Philippine Sea is one of them, you add plus one. And then the, the light blues are all optional. These are 
things that deal with different optional rules. So again, we're not playing with any optional rules in, the, in this example. So we're going to ignore all the light blue stuff. So effectively, we have seven air points that are going to roll at a plus one, and one air point combined to the CV one half that'll roll at a net minus one. So let me roll. It's all simultaneous though, so they're going to roll together. But let me just roll. I'll roll the the minus one first. So we roll a three minus one. That does nothing. And then we're going to roll seven, and we're going to add plus one, not plus ten, to each die. So if you look at the table, you're looking for anything seven or higher. So we have a nine, a seven, a nine, 11, and an eight. A seven, eight, two nines, and 11. So seven, eight, two nines, and 11. So we're going to eliminate one air point and abort the rest, basically. They only have four air points, so we've done more than four results. But the big thing is we only rolled one eight. So we only had one elimination. So the way we do eliminations for air, if you flip an air, you'll note that it goes to its used side. It doesn't go half strength. And this is because the number of air points is actually fairly critical. It, it's a fixed number. You do have breakdown units. I really didn't talk about this, but you have breakdown units if you need to make change. Again, naval units, like I said, are, are generally each individual capital ships, but there are breakdown units for some naval units that allow you to split up these double capital ship naval units, as well as the transports. You can see there's a couple of transports that can be broken down. And then ground units also have breakdown units if you want to break down a full strength division and send it off to do different things. So what we're going to do is use these breakdown units. It was a four point unit. We're going to do this just for simplicity. So the four goes back to the breakdown box because we just broke it down. And again, this is important. You, you have to make sure and we actually list here, there should always be 20 LBA points in here. So if you ever are uncertain, you can double check, make sure that you haven't uh, created extra air points somewhere. Three of these air points get marked aborted. So that should be an abort two and an abort one. Yep. And then this last air point is eliminated. So we are going to send this to the allied force pool. This is where units can get rebuilt from. And again, alternative, we could have just put a single one hit point marker under these air points. Now, since they're aborted, they're also marked used, and they will not be able to provide any ground support. Now, they do get the return fire. So remember, they had two return fire. So we'll just roll that, a five and a one. Uh, if you remember, I'll go over the chart you needed a seven or higher to have an effect. So five and a one is going to have no effect. So none of the Japanese air points are affected. Going again, so we did the, the one round of air combat. We then announce which ground units are involved in which combats that is placing these units basically where they're going to invade. And then we resolve any naval bombing. We don't have any. We resolve naval combat. Again, we don't have any. And then we're going to resolve ground combat. For turn one, there is a special rule that a maximum of three divisions can be committed on the American side. Normally, it's half the stacking of an area. So I think they could normally commit three and a half. but in turn one, they, they would only commit three. And you notice that all these militia divisions are actually half stacking. So let's just for argument's sake, they just commit their best three units. And then down here, there's just the one unit. So Japan is going to start with 20 factors here. And the defense is going to have seven, six, and five. So we're talking 18. Down here, Japan has three and the defense has two. Now the control markers, note that these control markers are zero, zero. So they're not going to add anything to the combat. They do have this four value here, which is anti-air for port attacks. If, if there's 
bombing being done on air on naval units in port, that's the value that would be added. Some of these control markers, especially the Japanese ones, represent intrinsic garrisons, and they do have two defense factor. Some will go up to four defense factor, like Formosa. No control marker will have an attack factor. They're, ne they're never involved in attacks. But for Luzon and Mindanao, there's no extra factors from the control marker. So these are just the raw factors involved. Now we look at what does Japan want to do with their air and ground support? Well, these six air points have to support here. So now they're up to 26 to 18. If they get one more point, then they are at three to two odds. So if you look, there is a three to two odds table. So they're going to want to add at least one more point of shore bombardment. But let's just do this one first, because this one's going to be easy. You can only add for air and shore bombardment, whatever the current ground combat strength is involved. So here you could add effectively up to 20 factors of shore bombardment, but here you can only add three. So we're just going to add one carrier. I'm just going to put it down there. And since we don't, I don't know if that's really, so it's three plus three, because again, even though this is a four, the most we can add is three. Three plus three is six. Six to two is three to one odds. We only have, if you remember, one and a half factors of air. So that's not enough to get us up to four to one. So the rest of these units are going to support this combat. I'm going to stack the transports together so I can get rid of them. So all these guys will support here. It may not make a difference. We may still end up at three to two, but for the purpose of this example, I'm just going to, to do it this way. And they could have brought in this other division maybe and landed here. Uh, so there's, there's many different ways that you could do this. By no means am I implying that what I'm doing here is the optimal initial invasion of the, of the Philippines. So let's run Luzon first. 20 factors plus six for this air is 26 plus one and a half for the air here is 27 and a half. And then we have another 12 shore bombardment. So 27 and a half and 12 is 39 and a half. 39 and a half, you have again, 18 defense. Well, that actually does bring us up to two to one. This combat is going to be resolved on the two to one table. There's not too many DRMs. Again, you see most of these are blue, so most of them are dealing with optional stuff. The big one is you have this plus one for the first impulse if there's a fort, and then the difference in the force quality. You subtract the defenders and add the attackers. It's rare that you get odds greater than six to one, but that does also give you a potential plus one. So we're looking at at least a plus one, and now let's look at troop quality. So for troop quality, you're looking at which is the the most i mean that there's actually a, a system to determine this but which is the most and you round up so for japan they have 10 four factor 10 factors of four troop quality and 10 factors of three troop quality so their troop quality is four for the us you have seven of three and um, yeah, we're looking at defense factors and 11 of two so their troop quality is only two Japan is going to add an additional plus two because the troop quality of four versus two. So their net DRM is going to be a plus three. They'd roll a D10, they'd roll a four, two to one odd, four plus three is seven, is a MMR. So the R means the defender is going to be forced to retreat or cancel the retreat by taking extra losses. If it's an MR, it's their choice. If it's an HR, they can't cancel the retreat, but if they don't have any place to retreat to, like on most islands, then there's a risk of surrender. In this particular case, the optional rule says, uh, special rule for turn one, says you treat MRs and HRs as just, just basically they take the extra losses. So for an R, it's canceled by taking an extra 50%. So effectively the result is, Two to one odds, rolling a seven, M, and then M 
plus 50% losses. So what does that mean? Well, M is medium losses. So you look at the factors in the smaller force. So remember you have 20 attack factors here, 18 defense factors here. So 18 is the smaller force. 18 factors, M means six factors. So Japan is going to lose six factors and the US is going to lose six plus half of that for three more or nine total factors. Again, I said this is attritional. Now, troop quality. At least half of your losses have to be from the troop quality that's used for the combat. So for Japan, half of their losses have to be the troop quality four. They would love to take them all on the troop quality three, but they can't. So it has to be three. Now they could take all six. That doesn't make any sense though. So they're gonna take three here and three there for their six losses. You place a hit marker under each unit. And now effectively, these units are seven, seven units. And they remain in Luzon. Luzon is now considered a contested land space. The US, as we said, has to lose nine factors, but their troop quality was only two. So they can take all their losses on these lower quality units. So they're going to take six losses here and then three losses on this unit. So if they flip him, you'll see that's exactly, well, it's actually two losses. So they're going to have to put a one hit marker. And this unit goes to the US force pool. And then this combat marker is flipped to its combat concluded in this island. Now we resolve the combat here. Now, Japan, since they're initiating the operation, they'd had the choice of which order to resolve these ground combats. So here we have three plus three for shore bombardment is six versus two. That's three to one odds. Troop quality, you have two versus one. So it's only a plus one for Japan. Then they also get the plus one for the turn one. So it's a three to one odds with a plus two. I'll roll the D10. So they didn't roll real well either. So three plus two is a five. So three to one odds, a five. You'll see again, it's it's another MMR, which it, it basically a very common uh, result. The MM result is basically your average result. So what is the smallest force? Well, there's only two for the defending force. So an M is one loss, but again, they have to take 50% extra. So the one becomes a two. Japan, however, loses only one factor. So losing two factors, this unit is eliminated. Reinforcements. And this takes one hit. So we place a one hit marker. Now, this combat, there's no more defending units. That means Japan takes control of this area. But because it wasn't undefended, there was some sort of combat, you place a control changing marker. What this means is Japan can't use the port. No, no one can really use the port yet. So they control it, but they can't base naval units here. Now, there are some exceptions with transports. Transports can always base, you can base one transport in, in any area, whether you control it or not. But they can't use this three-factor minor port to send in battleships or cruisers or anything yet. They have to wait until their next activation. So after the combats are resolved here, this again is flipped to combat concluded. We then rebase the air and the naval units. So just, let's just say for argument's sake, these guys go back to where they started. I think they were there. The cruiser was in Formosa. One of the transports was in Formosa. 
and let's send this transport. Now we'll send it over to Hainin. And the activated markers would be flipped to used. Because you can only activate these units once per impulse. And then the air units. So because they're contesting this area, they, Japan that is, gets half of the air basing. So that's six. The way air basing works is you can have up to double the value, but when you activate air for operations or interceptions, you're limited to whatever your air basing limit is. So they could put all 12 here, but they'd only be able to use six of them. So for our purposes, we're gonna put the four LBA there. I think this has an air basing of four. We'll put four nav here because this is all in the same area. And then they're going to return four back to Formosa. And these would get flipped to the use side. And then we do cleanup. So since operations are always on a full area as opposed to individual spaces, the combat concluded only really needs to remain in the area. So these extra combat markers can come off. And now for subsequent operations, subsequent movement, whatever Japan wants to do moving through here, they're going to be greatly restricted because they've already run the combat in here. But they have gotten their foothold in Luzon and they've taken Mindanao. And so that is an example of a operation. And you know, we didn't have actual naval combat. Again, naval combat, it could be several rounds, usually it becomes fairly obvious one side has an advantage over the other and the other side will try to disengage and escape uh, if you pursue you can't use those naval units to support any ground combats so a lot of times there's not a lot of pursuit because you're moving into an area to initiate some sort of of ground combat or initiate a, a port attack and so there's not a lot of incentive to pursue fleeing units you're in that area for a reason and that's that's an operation and you know, okay japan uh, looks at their force pool and they still have you know 59 activation points and now they can you know, activate some of these units to start going after the oil fields uh, they still have to activate units to go into siam and, and burma for for land movement we really didn't get into this but it's just one adjacent area you can't do something like that in one activation. It's just, okay, that's the activation. And then when they're done, they'd get marked used. And uh, hopefully this has shown you some aspects of the game and certainly the components and the excellent job uh, the artist has done and, and uh, the thought process that Rob put into the different units, especially the naval units and the different factors and all the research that he did uh, in terms of the different cruisers making up the different counters. Cruisers generally run about five cruisers per counter. So like I said, the capital ships are individual ships and a detailed order of battle in terms of the reinforcement schedule uh, for each nation. And just the general gameplay, how these operations work and, and how you have to sort of think ahead. It's, it's not something where you're, all, you're going to be able to activate all your units every impulse. You definitely are going to be limited in terms of the number of units that you can activate. And so you really have to think ahead in terms of, of what you want to accomplish that impulse and what units are needed, whether you can get away with the just skimming by so you save activation points for something else, or you further ahead throwing in the couple extra units to sort of guarantee success, but that may cost you the ability to do something else or, or move another unit to reinforce critical front, uh, so on and so forth. And that is our little display. So hopefully uh, you guys have seen uh, some good, good gameplay here and, and hopefully it interests you and piques your interest on Oceans of Fire.